Joseph was brought down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh's, the captain of the guard, an Egyptian, brought him to the hand of brought, bought him from the hand of the Ishmaelites, and it brought him down thither. The Lord was with Joseph. He was a prosperous man, and he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. And his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord had made all that he did to prosper in his hand. And Joseph found favor in his sight and he ministered unto him and he made him overseer over his house. And all that he had, he put into his hand. And it came to pass from the time that he made him an overseer in his house and over all that he had, that the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. And the blessing of the Lord was upon all that he had in the house and in the field. And he left all that he had in Joseph's hand. And he knew not aught that was what was with him, save the bread which he did eat. And Joseph was calmly and well favored. One of the movies that I really like is the one called Braveheart. Braveheart is a story about Scotland's pursuit of freedom from the tyranny of the English under the leadership of a guy by the name of William Wallace. Now, the idea of the movie and history is not even close, but uh, the movie's entertaining, so we'll just deal with that. Um, there's a scene to where uh, William Wallace and his men are fighting the English, and Wallace thought he had the backing of the Scottish nobles, but the Scottish nobles turned on him, and actually the battle went for the English against the Scottish, and he was routed because of their uh, tyranny against him. He will see the leader of the nobles, it's a guy by the name of Robert the Bruce, on the wrong side of the tracks. He actually is with the English. And that act of betrayal just almost destroys William Wallace because he thought that the leader of the Scottish would be behind him and trying to get rid of the tyranny of the English. There's a discussion. When Robert the Bruce gets back from the battle, he knows what he's done. And he's not living with himself really well because of his going against his own people. And his father, who's dying of leprosy, has a discussion with him. And it goes like this. His father turns to the son and says, I'm the one who's rotting, but I think your face looks graver than mine. Son, we have to have an alliance with English to prevail. You achieved that. You saved your family. You increased your land. In time, you're going to have all the power. And the son says, land, titles, men, power, nothing. The father says, nothing? And the son says, I have nothing. Men fight for me because if they don't, I will throw them off their land. I will starve their wives and children. Those men who bled the ground red at Falkirk fought for William Wallace. He fights for something I never had. And I took it from him when I betrayed him. I saw his face on the battlefield and it's tearing me apart. And his father says, all men betray. All lose heart. And the son says, I don't want to lose heart. I want to believe as he does. I will never be on the wrong side again. Joseph was a dreamer. Joseph was the younger brother. Joseph was the one favored by his father. And there's no if, ands, or buts about that. The, everybody understood that. Joseph was the one that was betrayed by those brothers. Joseph is the one that sold as a slave to some Ishmaelite merchants. And by the way, the slave price was less than 100 bucks. That means he was sold as some crippled slave. That was not a big price. So they took him to Egypt. And he's put it for sale as a slave, not as a promised son or anything like that, just a slave. Now put yourself in his position for just a moment. Look at who Joseph was. He's 17 years old. He is the favored son in a home where he's been given a multicolored cloak. Now basically, the father had basically told all the others he's chosen the youngest son to be the head of the family. Not the oldest son, as the protocol demanded, but the youngest son. And so Joseph's on the way to power. 
and influence and prominence in his family. This is great. Then in one moment, everything's gone. Stripped of your coat, betrayed by your family who loved you, you're separated from your father, you're sold as a slave, you're carried off into some strange land that you're not familiar with. Imagine how he felt as those camels crested that hill and he looked over a land that had those great pyramids. In fact, they've been standing for a thousand years when Abraham, his great, great grandfather went there. So they were there. The Sphinx was there. The great Egyptian temples, the opulent palaces of the pharaohs and all the, the religions and all that kind of stuff, that was all there. And that's what he saw. And he goes into this land and imagine the humility of being examined and sold as a slave. When you were marked to be the head of your family, you were marked for prominence. Yet that's not going to happen. Imagine the thoughts that went through his mind of betrayal and loss, a lack of love, a lack of humiliation, a loss of identity. And finally, of course, where's God? I thought serving him was supposed to produce something here. And yet this is it. And on the surface, it seems like circumstances couldn't be any worse for this kid. You know, those difficult days, he couldn't even imagine our stepping stones to something he really couldn't imagine, the greater glory that would eventually happen. It may appear that everything in his life was shattered. It may appear that everything in his life was gone. But the God who gave him those dreams in the first place, the dreams he told his brothers, the dreams that made them jealous of him, all those dreams, that same God is working behind the scenes just to ensure that one day they will be fulfilled. One day they will happen. Now, no one that sees all this trouble in his life could actually understand that as the Bible says in Genesis 39 and verse 2, that the Lord was with Joseph because it sure didn't seem like it. But it says he was. And what I want us to learn today, and it's something that I'm talking to myself more than anything else, is that God is always with his people to see them through trials, through problems. Because what God wants to do is through all the problems and all the trials that we go through, he wants to accomplish something in our life. There is a plan. There is a purpose. Even though we may not understand it, and even though it may seem like that everything's just kind of falling apart, there's something greater in line for us. So I want to join Joseph in the early days of his slavery. I want to show you the ways that God was with him. And as we study these, these ideas, what I want you to keep in mind is that what God did for Joseph, he'll do for us. If we just stay as faithful to him and his calling for us as Joseph did to his call. So first of all, let's look at the idea of protection. To say it a moment ago, it seems that everything had fallen apart. Nothing's going right. Yet examine the facts of this. And it becomes really clear that through all of this, Joseph is still in the hand of divine providence. Too many things just happened for this not to have been planned. And most of it is in Genesis chapter 37. So let me just go through a list of these. Number one, Reuben intervened on his behalf. They were going to kill him. And Reuben intervened and that saved him. They threw him in a pit. Then the idea to sell him as a slave. Not to keep him in a pit, not to let him sit there and starve to death, but let's sell him as a slave. So they did that. Then all, all of a sudden, as they decide to do this, you have the appearance of Ishmaelite traders just happening to pass by on a trade route about the time that they make this decision. And then, when he gets to Egypt, he's sold to Potiphar. Now, Potiphar is not some, you know, kind of happy-go-lucky guy that just kind of wanders to do the slave market to buy him. He's called the captain of the guard. Now, here's what we understand about this. It's not a military position. 
What we think Potiphar was, was he's kind of the head of Pharaoh's secret police. He's the guy that is in charge of protecting Pharaoh from outside influences. Because if you know anything about Egyptian history or ancient history, you know that a lot of the kings were just assassinated or their houses were turned against them, that type of thing. So there had to be an inner circle to kind of protect that person. And it seems like Potiphar was the guy that was over these people, that he's the one that's kind of responsible for protecting him. And anybody that dares to attack Pharaoh, he would take care of him. So he's kind of an executioner as well. Now, by virtue of that, he's probably in charge of a lot of officials or very prominent people in the land of Egypt, which means that uh, they come over to his house. Now, if they come over to his house, then obviously Joseph comes in contact with them. Now, I'm not saying he hobnobs with them or anything like that, but he's aware of who these people are. They're aware of who he is. Because it says that Potiphar's house grew increasingly great while Joseph was there. In fact, he said Joseph was put in charge of the whole thing. In fact, he said he didn't even know what was going on most of the time because Joseph just took care of everything. So he takes care of the parties. He takes care of all the people coming in. He takes care of all of this. Isn't it interesting that these influential people later on will be serving him? So God set up everything just like it needed to happen. Joseph was at the exact spot he needed to be so that these things could be put into place. Now, he might have been a slave in Egypt, but safely he was in the arms of divine providence. This is all part of the big plan, and he was part of it. And yeah, he might have been separated from his earthly father, but his heavenly father was still with him. It didn't matter where he went. His heavenly father was still there because Joseph allowed him to be there. You can see how much control God has in all of this by just the actions of the people that are involved in this whole thing. Joseph's brothers, the Ishmaelite traders, and Potiphar are all serving one thing, their own selfish interest. They don't care about really God's will at this point. It's just whatever they want. And all three of them only have that in mind. The brothers wanted to get rid of Joseph and his dreams. They were kind of sick of that. The Ishmaelites were out for a profit. It's all about money. And Potiphar was just looking for a good deal on a slave. That was basically it. And what did they get? What they didn't understand is that they were part of a plan that unwillingly they were all part of. That God was actually using these unfaithful, selfish individuals to fulfill his plan. I think that's interesting. God would do this with uh, kings, foreign kings many times, calling them his, his followers, his people, when in essence they really weren't, but they were part of the plan. It's a blessing to know that if we just try to do the best we can and follow God, that the events of our life are all part of his plan. And this is something that will be good and something that will help our life to be more enriched in accordance with what he wants us to be. So while the events of Joseph's life have kind of appear to be out of control and spinning out of control, they're actually really being controlled by God this entire time. And Joseph is being protected by God. How do we know this? Because it says in Genesis 39 and verse 2 that he was directed by God's presence. That God's presence was there. Did he feel God's presence? Did he see God's presence? No. Well, that type of thing. It's just God was there. He was someone who never became bitter. We don't ever read that he ever turned and blamed God or said, why is this happening? Or I don't understand this whole process. He just surrendered to his hardships. If he was with the Ishmaelites, he just kind of did whatever they needed him to do. When he was with Potiphar, he just served Potiphar. He did what he was supposed to do. When he's thrown in jail, well, he, you know, helps the people there. He's actually put in charge of the prison while he's there. So wherever he was, he kind of shined because he helped the people he was with. By God's providence, he was never off track. Because his mind was always there that if I serve them well, I'm actually serving God. 
And so all those dreams that had happened when he was younger, they're being fulfilled, but in God's way and in God's time. And maybe those are the things that sustained him. It was his belief that they would happen, that God was greater than all these other things. And even though he didn't have an assembly of people around him that helped to encourage him and stimulate him, he had his belief. We have the same protection. We have his presence. Hebrews 13 and verse 5. He says, I will never fail you or abandon you. We have his help to deal with our past, our problems, our present. In Ephesians 4, just giving some basic good advice to the Ephesian brethren, which had a pagan background and they were falling back to some pagan ways. He told them, let no harmful language come from your mouth. Only good words that are helpful in meeting the needs. Words that will benefit those who hear you. Don't cause grief to God's Holy Spirit. He stamped you as his property until the final day of redemption. So get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, violent assertiveness, slander, along with all spitefulness. Be kind to one another. Tenderhearted. Forgive each other. Just as in the Messiah, God has forgiven you. So the idea of, of anger and, and bitterness and, and, and you know, foul words and bad attitudes and all that, he says, that's not, not a part of the kingdom. He says, you can display a sweet spirit despite what's happening to you. You can rise above that like Joseph did. When he said that all things work together for good to those who are called according to his purpose, it's all called according to his purpose. That's where all things work together for good. And I know a lot of things happen in life that don't make a lot of sense. Be nice if God would explain sometimes some things to us. But it doesn't change the fact that God is still in control. Paul said to the Ephesian brethren, Ephesians chapter 1, In him we are chosen, we were predestined, according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity to the purpose of his will. In other words, it's up to him. How things work out is up to God. He said, what you have to do is you have to realize that this is all something that's part of you being a chosen person. Isaiah would, God would put it this way to Isaiah in Isaiah 46. I made known the end from the beginning of ancient times, what is still to come. I say, my purpose will stand and I will do all that I please. And he will. Now, will we understand what he does? No, we may not understand it at all. But obedience to the Lord, we have to understand sometimes it's going to put us right in the middle of the terrible eye of a storm. Look at church history. Read Fox's Book of Martyrs sometimes. Read about the people who suffered and died over the last 2,000 years because of their faith and because they wouldn't give up their faith. This proved true in Joseph's life. He's thrown in jail because he's lied about and he wouldn't succumb to it. This is true about Jesus. In Isaiah 53, prophesying about Jesus, it says, It was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, he will see his offspring and prolong his days, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand, but not without crushing him, and not without causing him to suffer. You see, for the will of the Lord to prosper, those things had to happen. So God's purpose, and all the things that happen to us, and all these trials, and all these, these tribulations that occur, is not to hurt us, is to develop us. Is to make us into what he wants us to be. And we can trust him. We're just saying trust and obey. That's the idea. To protect us and to grow us amid the hardships of life. He told Jeremiah, I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you, not to harm you. 
plans to give you hope and a future. But if you know anything about Jeremiah, it was not a rose garden he walked through. But God was still in control. God prospered Joseph. When Joseph arrived in Egypt, he didn't have his coat of many colors. That was gone. His brothers dipped that in a lamb's blood and showed it to their father, telling him that he'd been killed. But his character was still with him. The coat that was given to him by his father, oh, that was a symbol of his position in the family. Marked him as overseer, kind of the head of the family, the one kind of in charge, a man of authority. His authority didn't come from a robe. His authority didn't come from a piece of cloth. His authority came from who he was. The type of character that he had, the type of spiritual direction that he was going in. He was a godly young man who walked before his father in absolute integrity, unlike some of his brothers. So when he lost his coat... He didn't lose anything that made him a great man. He just lost his coat. And then what did he wear? The garments of a slave. But he was still a man of character. It didn't matter what he wore. It's who he was. And that's what we need to be. It's people of integrity, people of good character. You know, it's, Interesting to say, well, I know that person is this in church, but when you get on Main Street, <laughs> something else. No, uh, that shouldn't be. It should be that the person we are here is the person we are there. People of integrity. People of character. Regardless of where we go or what position we're in or where we are. We should strive to do the right things and say the right things and be the right person at all times in all situations. We should determine in our hearts that the attitudes we're going to have are going to be good. We will demonstrate God and Christ all the time in all that we say and all that we think. And when Joseph arrived in Egypt, how many paths could he have taken? Look at all that he saw before him, all the riches of Egypt, all the, the spectacular engineering feats that, that were done by them. Oh, he could have adopted the ways and the customs of that land. That would have been really easy. He could have abandoned God and embraced all the polytheistic religions of Egypt. That would have been extremely easy. He could have had an adulterous relationship with Potiphar's wife. She wanted him. It says so. And he wouldn't. He stayed the course. He kept the faith. He may have been purchased by Potiphar, but he belonged to God. And that's who he stayed faithful to. It didn't make any difference whether he was in his father's house or in a pit. In the possession of slave traders. In Potiphar's house. In jail. It didn't matter where he was. His heart purpose to do the right thing wherever he was in whatever situation he was in. And that's what he did. He was a man of integrity. Regardless of any situation he found himself in, because that's who he was. And we need to do that also. We have to establish those kind of boundaries for our lives. We need to make up our minds. There are some things we're just not going to do. There are some things we're just not going to be a part of. It doesn't matter what the world says. It doesn't matter what other people are addicted to. What they think is great, the party scene, you know, the whole bit. If it's not going to magnify God, if it's not going to position me as a man or a woman of integrity that allows God's will to be done in my life, despite all the circumstances and everything that's going on, then I'm not going to do it. My mind is made up and that situation is settled. That won't happen because I can't. And allow God to be seen. Now Joseph was also prosperous. Verse 3 says. The Lord made all that he did. To prosper in his hand. All that he did. Now some might have looked upon this. And said well that's just good luck. That's just. He was just a good. 
you know, manufacturer. He was a good person, and this is just the way things happen. I want you to know there's no such thing as luck in this situation. As far as I'm concerned, luck is for fairies and gnomes and little sprites. It doesn't really have anything to do with children of the living God. This is God working through him. Period. God was blessing him because Joseph was following him. That's why he prospered. God saw in Joseph a man he could trust to do what he wanted him to do. Therefore, the prosperity came. So what some people maybe call luck in a Christian's life is nothing more than a manifestation of godly character. Many have enjoyed God's blessings because they have integrity. It doesn't mean we will. It means we can. And many are blessed because he can trust them to do what he wants them to do. Good. Joseph's in a bad situation. He's in a lot of bad situations. But his life was still one that, despite whatever situation he was in, was blessed by God over and over and over and over. And I'm sure that some days it was nothing more than endless drudgery and boring service that he was a part of. Can you imagine in jail? What a life of uh, great, surprising revelations every day that was. And in Potiphar's house, I mean, you know, take care of the household, you know, chores and all that. I mean, you know. Yeah, it had to be boring sometimes and just like, you know, what's the big purpose here and all that. He was still faithful to God and all that he did. He saw nothing of this. He just saw God's working through him and him working for God and just trying to allow God to be seen and all that he did and said. And that's what happened. So here's a couple of things I don't want you to miss. Just because we go through trials and problems does not mean that God's not blessing us. And I have to remember that now. That just because there's problems, God is still trying to do something through this. Now, I might not see him moving, but, Lord, you picked the right song. We have to trust and obey. For there is no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. He'll manifest his presence. He'll manifest his glory. He'll manifest his power when he wants to. And all you have to do is read this. Over and over and over. He does it. With Moses, it took 80 years. It may take that long for us. But it will happen. Joseph made the best of terrible situations. Why? Because of his attitude. And so should we. The secret to happiness in hard times is how you respond to them. Not what they're doing to you. 90% I think of living a joyful life is simply responding well to the trials that we have in it. There are going to be bad times. There are going to be things that we don't understand. And we can either act as the world does. Or we can act as God does. Life is what we make it. Story of two grasshoppers that fell into a bucket of fresh milk. One just said, oh, forget it. And just gave it up and sank and drowned. The other one decided to fight against it. So he kicked and kicked and kicked and churned that milk into a pat of butter and hopped out. It's all about how you handle it. Either you give up or you fight. And you try to understand and you try to do the best you can with it. There was a great preacher in the 17th century in England called John Bunyan. He was put in jail for 17 years, excuse me, 12 years, because he wouldn't tell the court that if he was released, he wouldn't preach. While he was in prison, he had a three-legged stool. He took one of the legs 
and fashioned it into a flute and started playing gospel hymns on the flute in prison while he was in a cell. He was a man of character. He was a man of integrity. He's also the author of a little piece he wrote while he was in jail called Pilgrim's Progress. It is the second most bought Christian work, second only to the Bible, in the work of in history that's been bought. And Pilgrim's Progress is basically a, just a work about uh, Christian trials and how people go through life. And he wrote it while he was in prison. He could have given up. But he decided to use the place to glorify God in whatever situation he could, and so he did. Isn't it interesting that God promoted Joseph? He saw the hand of God was upon uh, Joseph, Potiphar did, and said, uh, okay, good, just take over everything. <laughs> You're so good in that area, let's just see what you can do with the rest of it. And with the rest of it, he did great. Over everything except his wife. And that was the one that wanted him. That was the temptation. And he walked away from that one. A man of industry, a man of integrity, a man of God, a man he could trust. Joseph served Potiphar like he would have served God himself if he'd been here. You know, we all answer to somebody. We might have a boss at work. We might have uh, you know people that we're under, that we work with, people we work alongside of. Working eight hours a day for eight hours of pay is good. Doing what the boss asks you that you know you can do within the lines of integrity that's good. You do it without complaint. You do it without an attitude. Because so many other people do have that. You serve your employer like you serve the Lord. Paul talked to the Ephesian brethren about that too. Ephesians 6, he says, Slaves, obey your earthly masters with respect and fear and sincerity of heart, just as you would obey Christ. He's talking to slaves. Obey them not only to win their favor when their eyes on you, but as slaves of Christ, when you're doing the will of God from your heart, you serve them wholeheartedly as if you were serving the Lord, not people. Because you know that the Lord will reward each one of you for whatever good they do, whether they are slave or free. And that's what he did. Served with industry, served with integrity, just like he would God. That's the way he served Potiphar. Like cream in the milk, he just continued to rise to the top. Regardless of what situation he was in, he walked with integrity. He sought to glorify God. He wanted to show him forth in his life. And that ought to be true of all of us. And everything that we do, everything that we say, every situation we find ourselves in, it is God that wants to be seen. In Matthew chapter 5 and verse 16, Jesus said, in the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Why? Because they know that's why you're doing it. You're not doing it for you. You're doing it for him. So here's a man who glorified God and God glorified him in a wonderful way. The Lord would do the same to us. We follow the same pattern. If he can trust us with the task and the situations he has assigned to us and he puts us in, he'll entrust us with greater things down the road. In Luke 16, Jesus said, He that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much. And he that is unjust in the least is unjust also in much. We bloom where we're planted. Years ago, there was a uh, little thing that came out on the news about a parakeet named Chippy. 
Chippy never saw it coming. Perched in his cage one day and everything was fine. Then all of a sudden, things changed. Here's how it happened. Chippy's owner decided to clean Chippy's cage with a vacuum cleaner. She removed the attachment from the end of the hose and stuck it in the cage and then the phone rang and she went to answer it. She barely said hello when all of a sudden she heard swoop and Chippy wasn't there anymore. She gasped, put down the phone, turned off the vacuum cleaner, opened it up, and there was Chippy, still alive, but a bit stunned. The bird was covered with dirt and dust. And so, not thinking, she ran to the bathroom, turned on the faucet, and stuck Chippy under the faucet. Well, now Chippy is soaked and shivering, and she thought, oh no, what have I done? And so she did what any compassionate bird owner would do. She went for the hairdryer. She popped it on full stream on Chippy. Chippy never knew what hit him. A few days later, somebody who had originally written about this event was asking the owner, how's the bird recovering? And she said, well, Chippy doesn't sing much anymore. He just sits and stares. <laughs> it's not hard to see why. He was sucked in, washed up, and blown over. That's pretty much enough to take a song from the stoutest heart. And poor Chippy, I'm afraid that's what it did. In the same way, Joseph was kind of sucked in, washed up, and blown over. And God used all those things to turn him into something, but he never lost his song. He never just sat and stared. That's what a lot of people do. Because the trials he faced, he decided that they were trials that were given to him for some reason. And he wasn't going to quit. He just depended upon God. And they turned his heart into something that was tender and compassionate, as we see later with his brothers. Those rascals who sold him into slavery. Boy, he could have really gotten that them back then. But his trials taught him the value of a lot of things. Especially tears. Because if you remember when he saw his brothers, he had to be separated from them to go and cry in a separate room. Trials made him useful to God. He saved an entire nation later on when he had a seven-year famine come. It was because of him and his faithfulness to God that these people were saved. So we don't shun the trials of life. We don't back off from them. In shunning them, we may be shunning the best thing that God's trying to give us. A man by the name of A.W. Towser once said, It's doubtful that God ever uses anyone greatly without hurting them first deeply. And he may be right. An unknown poet penned this, these words. I walked a mile with pleasure as she chattered all the way. But she left me none the wiser for all she had to say. I walked a mile with sorrow, and narrow words said she. But oh, the things I learned from her when sorrow walked with me. And the Lord was with him. We won't face the trials alone. <clears throat> We don't walk to the valley of the shadow of the death long. We walk with God. And if you need to, and you have something on your heart, let me ask you to come. Together we sing as you stand. That's why I sing the song of invitation.